one of the very best times I've ever had in this studio, I spent in the company of the man you are about to see. I won't say any more at this stage, but this is how it happened. Now, what, what, come here. what we did... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and w- welcome to the Danny K show. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have an extraordinary guest this evening, and he's come all the way from... Where? <laughs> Where does one come from when they say, don't, don't put me in a panic? <laughs> Where's that? Brixton. It's Black, Blackpool, Liverpool. Anyway, we're going to bring him out, and we're going to ask him a lot of questions because he has been around for... Do you know anything about Russell Hardy at all? <laughs> do you? Do you know what he used to do or how he started in this thing? I think we're going to turn the tables on him. And what I'd like you to do when we bring him on... Hmm, uh, good evening, dear Russell. How are you? How are you? Give me a key in that. <laughs> oh, up a little bit. Uh, good evening. Mm. Oh, that's fine. Good evening, dear Russell. Good evening, dear Russell. How are you? <laughs> now you all sing with me. Good evening, dear Russell. How are you? How are you? Good evening, dear Russell. We're happy tonight. Okay, now it's very simple. Let me hear this group on this side sing. Good evening, dear Russell. How are you? How I look. Wait a minute. We'll be out in a minute. We got forty-five minutes. Okay. Good evening, dear Russell. How are you? Right, now this group over here. Good evening, dear Russell. How are you? <laughs> that is pathetic. <laughs> it really is awful. Let me hear all of you all at once. Good evening, dear Russell. Would you mind standing up for a minute, please? <laughs> That is very nice. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Russell Hardy, that incredible young man. Russell, come on. No, you don't have to say that those are the most peculiar shoes I've ever seen. <laughs> now, where, where That's did you number get one gone off the list. Oh. Right. <laughs> where did you get the shoes? I got them at the shop next door to the place where they sold yours. <laughs> now, the reason we talked about that, he came up to see me yesterday, and the Russell and I had a nice chat, and he said, Where did you get those peculiar things? And I said, Oh, I'm going to get them in New York or whatever. And he said, Are they terribly comfortable? And I said, No. They kill my feet, but they're so beautiful I can't resist wearing them. <laughs> so there you are. Are they terribly expensive? Yes. You, are you prepared to reveal how much they are? Yes, they cost $631. That's uh, nine pounds. Does that mean- <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I don't know, since the whole devaluation of the dollar and the things. Now, we're supposed to sit in No, just the- sit, sit comfortably. Yeah. You told me. <laughs> well, it's certainly a great pleasure to be here on the Russell Hardy Show. It's one of the most comfortable chairs I've ever seen. In and it makes for great relaxation, I must say. Good. Well, do you want a glass of water as well while you relax? Why? <laughs> well, you, I mean, I thought it Would might. Would you do me a favour, Russ? Russ? Does what? anybody call you Russ? My friends do. <laughs> All right, Russell. <laughs> now, 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 I would like you to open... Would you like to open your, your, your collar? Is it the start of something big? No, no, it isn't. <laughs> just, just, I, I must explain that I don't usually dress this way. See, I usually dress much more casually <clears throat> than I did... T- and what the other thing was, I was afraid my voice was going to go... <laughs> But it, it's going to work out fine. I do just for one hour. Yeah. You, you promised me this morning that you would go to your throat specialist. I'm talking. I'm talking. So I'm talking to a dumb. You know. Sort of, 
you promised me this morning you would go to work. Yeah, I will. <laughs> and he said, I can, only, I can only do one aria, the one from Bohem where the, 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 the two high Ds. <laughs> <laughs> do you want us to loosen our collars? It is very... Oh, I almost said something rude. I'm surprised you're wearing a jacket it's because I was told on the highest possible authority that you, that you didn't ha travel with the jacket. No, I, I travel with a jacket. I knew I was going to come here and I was going to do your show and in deference to the people who came to see me at the Palladium in 1887 <laughs> <laughs> and who still remembered me when I had short hair, <laughs> I thought it would be nice if I put on a shirt and tie. Good. Well, it's, oh, we're happy to see you here. Yes. You were saying to me at some time back as well that, that when, you, when you first... <laughs> <laughs> your first ever... You're switching around a bit to me now. Your first ever appearance in London was not uh, the most successful appearance you ever made on any stage. That was at the Dorchester. Do you remember the Dorchester? Yes, I remember the Dorchester. My first appearance in London at the Dorchester <laughs> was the enormous bomb of all time. Now, bomb doesn't mean the same here as it means oh, over Well, there. it was a disaster. It was pathetic. It was incongruous. It was pitiful. It was shattering. It was <laughs> stunning. It was debilitating. It was thought-provoking. <laughs> and it was bloody off. <laughs> why, do you, why do you always look to me at times as though you're walking on ball bearings? You know what ball bearings are? Now, is, this a, is this a family show? <laughs> What do you mean, why do I look like I walk on board? You're going to start with me with now with, 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 with the graceful b b thing like no, Dick no, no, Cabot no, did? No, 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 no. I, I told him a story last night. I went on Dick Cabot's show, and he said, does it bother you when people speak of you as a graceful man, which somebody did? And I said, no. And three nights later, I had a terrible accident on the stage, and I was on crutches for <laughs> eight and a half months in the show. And then we came back, and we surprised him. I Obviously. really should cut my hair. Right. <laughs> when I meant by bald bearings, is that occasionally when I see, in films that I've seen of you, you look as though you're walking through a mine, a very delicate minefield, and that you've got to tread your way carefully. I wondered whether was that, that was something that... Is your throat better? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I used to do that, <coughs> we used to work a lot at the Goldwyn Studios. Now, do you know what pine nuts are? Pine nuts? Yes. Pine cones. Pinola. <laughs> Pardon? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what pronunciation is there. Yes, those little tiny ones with the shells. Now, we used to eat those all day long, and they would be littered on the sound stage. Now, do you know what that does to a, a man on the boom? When people would walk by here... <laughs> so we learn to kind of... <laughs> Through the pine nuts. That's why I walked on the balls of my feet. And that's about as likely an explanation as you can get. <laughs> okay. In all your lovely long history. Yes. 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 <laughs> what, is, what is the most disastrous flop, apart from the Dorchester film wise, that you've ever suffered? Yes? <laughs> well, I was asking what was the most successful film you'd ever been in. It's the most successful film I'd ever made was Me and the Colonel, which caused Columbia Pictures to go into bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, but that, I don't know. That's about as... It was terrible. It was, a good, it, was a, it was a good movie. Who knows what a good movie is, really, except for, the, for those who go to see the movie. And then when people like it, it's a good movie, and when they don't like it, it isn't a good movie. And... When you make a movie, you either like it or you don't. Now, there are a lot of movies I liked that were not successful, and a lot of movies that I didn't like that were successful. Me and the Colonel, I kind of liked. I thought it was a, you know, a good movie, and it was something different, and I hadn't done anything like that before. And it was really... <laughs> and it was a disaster. The box office disaster. The what? Was it a box office disaster? Disaster. You're putting me in a panic. Hasn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, he got an adorable accent? <laughs> huh? Where's he from? Where are you from? Manchester? Blackburn. 
What? It's very near to near to Manchester. Blackburn. Yeah. It's a very lovely sort of villagey little. Now is that spelled B L A C K B U R N? Very good. Very good. Well, that's terribly unusual. Why? Well, it should be pronounced Boo Boo. <laughs> All the names in England get me crazy. When I first came here, they, oh, it, it's really marvelous. They used to say, "Well, we're, we're, we're driving up to Leicester." And I thought it was spelled L E S T E R. And it's what? L E I C E I S T E R, right? Well, I think you well that's like the ice iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> it may be where you come from. I mean, we've been living. Right? I, we speak very, very good English indeed where I come from. Where do you come from? I beg your pardon. Where do you come from? <laughs> Hi, Wickham. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now Where look. I come from, we talk a lot of very, very good English. Very good. Because, yeah, it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to talk uh, proper. <laughs> proper meaning that all R's become V's and all BR's become BV's or PR's become PV's. Like, for instance, <laughs> if, I, if I were to tell you that my my brother <laughs> was studying to be a priest. <laughs> but he couldn't... Uh, he didn't like the parochial school, so he became a printer. <laughs> Where about, is that Brooklyn? Yes, <clears throat> it is a specific part of Brooklyn. You know how many accents you have here in... Not in London, within one square mile of London. Mm. It's big million all over again. And it's kind of marvelous because it, within the city of New York, you have as many different varying kind of accents as you have in London. And you have as many in the United States as you have in England. And it's kind of fun. Good, thank and you. I think. Thank you. Now, uh, I, uh, no, no, stay there. Stay there. Uh, we've got 47 seconds. The, um, Phil, let, let's get... Let, let, you're going to have to snap again. Let's get Russell, back. Russell, you're going to have to snap again. <laughs> yeah, it's better. Right. Right. <laughs> In the, all the films that you've done, or a lot of films that I've seen that you've done, you've flung yourself around a lot. You're, you're, very, you're a very physical kind of person, you know what I mean? <laughs> <coughs> Would you like to rephrase that question? I think you've got the tenor of my Yes, substance. I have got the tenor and the baritone and the bass <laughs> of your question. Yes, I do. I used to do a lot of things... Foolishly, mind you. Foolishly. It wasn't really necessary. But there was some strange kind of pride. I don't know what, what the hell it had to do with anything. Not anything, really. About wanting to do my own kind of stunts. Before you, it was before, crazy. Before we talk about them in detail, we've got a little shot of them, or some shots of them, which should be coming up any second now of you flinging yourself around. We've all. got a little shot. <laughs> with bruises after yes. that? Yes. Bruises, broken bones, all kinds of things. Did you have to keep yourself physically fit? I mean, did you, yes. did you do exercises? No. <laughs> <laughs> but your voice is better, though, isn't it? Not now. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be in a little while. For the bits that we've, we've just looked at. You don't then. exercise at all, do you? No. Why? 
I don't have the time. I have to keep rushing from one place to another meeting. From one one place to another meeting. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> he, he tried to hide it then for a minute, didn't he? <laughs> meeting from one place to another. Meeting yeah. beautiful people. You say love and, and, and bloody and things like that. <laughs> Of course I bloody do. <laughs> do you? Last, no, why would I say that? We, well, say, because we say printer. <laughs> <laughs> Russell, it means the same thing either place. Does it? Yeah, but do. you are a chameleon, aren't you? No, I sometimes do dramatic roles. <laughs> A good. chameleon being a little animal which changes its color. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. Do you play uh, tennis at all? No. Do you, do you fence? Yes. Still? No. <laughs> Are you laconic? I beg your pardon? <laughs> no, I'm quite regular. <laughs> Have you ever given anybody the kiss of life? <laughs> or the kiss of death, maybe. I, mean. uh, I gave somebody the kiss of life. <clears throat> and then I had a terrible problem because it was a man. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it was a... Uh, no. I've never given anybody... You mean resuscitated mm. somebody? Mm. Oh, no, no. Mm. no. But you are keenly interested in your own health, aren't you? you, you did, did you don... You said to me yesterday you were going to don your shoes and your shorts and go and fling yourself not around. these. No, not those, but running shoes. Yes. Did you, did you do that? Did you go no. out this morning? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was... Uh, it, was <laughs> it was raining. <laughs> God, I'm naughty tonight. <laughs> You're naughty but nice. Oh, no, that's nice. We have to take a tiny break at... OK, before we... Can we have one second before we take yeah, the please, break? please, please. No, no. The thing I, I would like to say, I don't know, either to that camera or somebody... Well, you've got four. Choose. Now, we have done a lot of these shows in the United States and throughout the world, really. And I must here publicly explain to everybody watching and listening that you are as easy to talk with and to work with as anybody I have ever done one of these shows with. And I just want to tell you before we get off the air. OK? Lovely. Back in two minutes. With Dan. Russell Hunty Plus Part 2, production number 9250, date recorded 19th of the 9th, 73, take one.
some of those tunes? But that was a little musical tribute for you. To get your voice. Oh, so that I would get over my. <laughs> Do you use a baton ever? Yes. Under which circumstances do you use a... Uh, well, I shall tell you in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I use a baton, as we call it here at home, <laughs> when I'm conducting an orchestra. And I've done that in practically every part of the world. And usually it's for the musician's pension fund. And up to date, we've raised about three and a half million dollars. And I have conducted... What's that in real money? Real money? Again, it's nine pounds. It always... <laughs> 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 it it's VAT. No, it always comes out to nine pounds. <laughs> My hotel bill comes out to nine pounds. The airfare comes out to nine pounds. <laughs> the automobile comes out to nine pounds. The makeup came out to nine pounds. <laughs> Everything. Your fee? Nine pounds. <laughs> yes, that's the only thing that is grossly, <laughs> that is grossly overrated. Oh, sorry. That's uh, overpaid. Sorry. Because I should be paying you for the, <laughs> for the privilege of letting me come here and speak to all you lovely people in this beautiful country where I've spent so many, many, many happy years. So if you would like, I will give you the nine pounds back. <laughs> Does it include VAT, that? VAT? Is that mm. the Veterans Administration Transit? <laughs> <laughs> That's VAT. It's a thing called value-added tax, which our government, in its infinite wisdom, has uh, considered necessary to add on to the bottom of things to make it more. I think that makes sense. You do? <laughs> yes. Because basically, within, within the economic framework, having it withheld... <laughs> those basic priorities insofar as sufficiently condemning the expenditures not withheld on the basis of citizenship as per for having yet withdrawn those qualifications, I think that we, as a government, cannot abide by. <laughs> and if you will notice, the same kind of political talk goes on here, and it sounds exactly the same in the United States, and in India. Right. <laughs> no, they talk very difficultly about that. It's, it's really, but it, it all sounds the same, doesn't right. it? They all say good things, but it all does sound the same. I listened to the liberal speaker today on television. What's the head of the liberal party? Mr. Jeremy Thorpe. 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 Yes. He made a very fine speech. He gave the Labour Party what for? <laughs> and the Conservatives. I don't think he's crazy about the communists either. <laughs> anyway, yes, I do conduct orchestras and I do not read music. I you think that's a complete non sequitur. I hope it's the first of many. Yes. When did uh, when did you last raise a baton? Uh, four <laughs> weeks ago. That was meant to be a serious question. I yeah. think an innuendo crept into my voice. No, 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 no. It was a perfectly legitimate, lovely question. Four weeks ago. Four weeks ago in Monte Carlo. Is it I true that you sometimes uh, throw discretion to the winds and conduct with your... <laughs> I wish you hadn't asked me then. Yes, I do. And, <laughs> and stand with your back to the orchestra. Yes. Why? That seems to be an arrogant gesture. Not at all. Right. Not at all. Mr Hardy, have you ever gone to a concert? Frequently. Frequently. Now, for as long as you can remember, have you ever seen the face of a conductor? Only if I've been very much so Oh, fine, see? Most people go to concerts, really see the back of a conductor. And if you have any curiosity about how they communicate with their players, you must wonder what they look like, how they do it. Right. So what I do is I explain to the audience that I will conduct some piece, you know, something from Wagner or the... Prelude to Low and Grin or the Triumphal March of Aida or something, except I will face the audience and then I will explain to them how the conductor manages to communicate with the orchestra. And, you know, you do all the things and they're not playing properly. You know, wh whatever you might be saying. The lady cellists always have to play this way. So. <laughs> 
But doesn't that doesn't that sort of uh, doesn't that what doesn't that uh, uh, persuade the Why audience? Why are you getting suddenly man manic like Bernie in it? Well, when I'm easy and relaxed and comfortable, I go I go northern. Oh, I like that. You see, I like. And I'm, God knows I'm easy and relaxed yes, and comfortable. Yes, you right. I mean, I'm much just, more nervous I mean, yesterday. Loved it. Yeah. Was I? Yes. Well, because mm. you know, I thought you. Were... Yes, and you you were in a panic. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that put the audience off? Aren't they watching you conducting rather than listening to the music? I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> why are you? Um, why have you developed this terrible penchant? That's a French word, not a northern word. Maybe northern French. Um, why have you developed this terrible penchant for punctuality? Are you afraid of missing something? No. I hate like hell to be kept waiting. So I don't like to keep others waiting. And I think it's, it's, I'd tell you where I developed it. I developed it from very, very early on in my life when curtains used to go up at, you know, 8.40 or 8.30 or 7.15 or whatever it is, and you had to learn to be on time because it was terribly rude for a curtain to go up and for you not to be there. When I ask people in my house and they come at, uh, I ask them at 7.30 and they come in at 8.15, I don't have a happy evening anymore. Does that really throw you for the whole evening? No, it doesn't throw me. It, I may be cooking something, you see. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to cooks, they will understand that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, it shows a, it, it, it's not being terribly considerate. I think to keep people wait. Now, come on, you know, you get into a traffic jam or whatever, or you get unavoidably detained. Well, that's fine. You pick up a phone and say, "Look, you know, I'm terribly late, and I'll be there, you know, 20 minutes later." It's the people who really don't make any effort to let you know they're going to be late mm -hmm. and walk in as though they're on time, with never a care in the yes. world. My wife puts Einstein to shame. <laughs> 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 we live in Los Angeles, in Beverly Hills, and we had to go to Malibu one night, and that's 45 minutes away. By and car, my, is that? Yes. And my wife has that. We had to be there at 8 o'clock. And my wife has this strange notion that if she leaves our house at 8 o'clock, she's automatically on time, <laughs> <laughs> even if it's two hours away. Okay? You set so, off. So, no, we have two cars now. <laughs> I arrive on time and she comes the week after. <laughs> I've been watching you, what you've been explaining about in a rather French way, uh, the delicacy of your hands. You've got very delicate hands. <laughs> well, yeah, people have said that to me. Uh, <laughs> same thing as being graceful, because uh, actually when, when people say, oh, you have very graceful hands, you say yes, and these two big claws come out. But they're very, very they're easy to work with. Which gives me what can only be the most perfect clue in the world for having a look at your hands in a bit of action on film. Yes. It's only a tiny piece, but it's of you doing mercurial things see with it? your hands. I there. I see that. <coughs> oh, this is not a trick. You are sure? Study them yourself. You will find you are now in complete possession of Lafayette XV-27. Mm. 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 Two simple blueprints which hold the greatest power of annihilation the world has ever known. Ah, yes. Excellent. No question about these being the complete plans. Very good. Very good indeed. Hmm. Hmm? Whoever controls this weapon may well control the world. <laughs> I'm suggesting a renegotiation of our agreement. What do you mean, renegotiation? Just that. Renegotiation of the money. I'm sorry. Bruchik, you realize... I only you realize this. I am about at the end of my patience. We have made a commitment. A firm and generous commitment. I've lived up to my end of the bargain and expect you to do likewise. You realize that we've run more risks than planned. That's entirely your affair, my dear Langston. You made the deal and... What do you mean, more risks than planned? Four men have had to be killed. Four men? Brodnik? Gromek, Papinek, and Shashlik. <laughs> well, you know what's funny about that? I was under, there were two people negotiating, and I was under the table, and one was scratching his thigh, you know, and the, his hand was on another one. So I had to substitute one hand for his doing the thing, and we did that in one take. One take? Yeah. 
Okay, and we, I didn't know. We didn't know how, exactly who was going to do what. We knew they were going to emphasize it. But I had to watch them like crazy with the drumming and then onto this thing. That must, must mean that you, you can see two lots of things out of two eyes. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, you must be able to look that way and that way at the same time. It's called time. peripheral vision. Is it? Fly, yes. Flies have it, don't they? <laughs> It's a dirty show. <laughs> <laughs> is it true that what film was that incident? That was a knock, knock on wood. Right. Is it true well, that you can actually, as I have heard and may do in part believe, as Shakespeare says, and this all may be a figment of that man's imagination who wrote this book about you, is it true you can sign uh, two autographs at the same time with each hand? No. <laughs> no. No. Why don't you practice it? It could be a rather good trick. <laughs> well, why don't you practice, you know, skating with both feet at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> well, why not, why not? Well, what do you mean, why don't I practice it? Well, after watching your ambidexterity... In that I'm thing. not ambidextrous. You are on that oh, piece of no. film show. Would you put one hand on your knee, please? What will it lead to? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> not on mine. <laughs> That's it. Okay, now just do this with your right hand. And tap with this hand. No, don't. Okay? Yeah. Tap, tap. Slice, tap. Well, that's all we have to well, well, why don't you practice? <laughs> practice? If you practice, well, sure, you can make a great living with that. Go out, get a little store somewhere and say, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you now the peripheral dexterity of manipulative with graceful fingers. Uh, ask him about his flower. <laughs> Do you still work uh, closely with children? Are you still on, on the UNICEF wagon? Yes. As a matter of fact, when I go home, I'll be home about 12 days. And then I go back to Germany on the 19th of October and... There's a UNICEF thing going on in television. I've got to make a speech. <clears throat> then the end of October, they are building, they have built a bridge across the Straits of the Bosporus, which connects Asia and Europe. And it's the 50th anniversary of Turkey. And so they're going to have some 40 heads of state, and they're going to be parades up and down. I'm going to have a bunch of children in their native costume. We'll walk from one continent to another. And that's all UNICEF. And it's been one of the most rewarding things in my life. I've had a marvelous time doing it. It's been almost 20 years now that I've been working with UNICEF. Is there anybody on the horizon you, that you know of that will take your place as and when such a time comes that you can't carry on with it? Oh, I'm sure a lot of people can. But there isn't anybody of your eminence or, or stature who can... Who there could... will be somebody. Always, there's always somebody. Nobody is ever indispensable in anything in life. Well, they are. It's no. not true. Yes, of course it is. I mean, it's not true. You're not I, right. No, I, I think I am. I think there may be some accommodations one might have to make, but there's nobody literally in any field of life who is not, who is not replaceable. You're wrong. I'm thinking of a case now. Supposing, for instance, we were in a 707 or a 747 jetting across the yes. Atlantic, and the pilot had a funny do. Yes. Well, he, he's not indispensable. Of course he is. There's a co-pilot. Well, supposing the co-pilot caught the funny dude that was going on in the next seat. There's an engineer who was also <laughs> qualified to take over the control. And if I were with you, you could... I would do it. Right. You fly? Yes. <laughs> what kind of an aeroplane? <clears throat> I started with a Cessna 150, which is as big as this platform. And the last thing I flew was a 747. Oh, really? Yeah. Did you, uh, did you just sit there with your hand on a stick or did you land it? <laughs> did I land it? <laughs> yes, I landed it and I took it off as well. You did? And I've flown a DC-10 and I've flown a 707 and I've flown a DC-8 and a 737 and a 727. And I had a jet commander and I was vice president with the Learjet Corporation. And I heard that one day that, that uh, you were having friends to dinner 
and you were preparing the food Chinese style. Mm -hmm. and well, you, did, did, wait a minute, what does that mean, Chinese style? But it was Chinese food. Yeah, well, then it's Chinese style. It's like when people say to me, are you a gourmet cook? And I say, I don't know what that means. And they said, well, you know, do you cook gourmet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never cooked a gourmet in my whole life. <laughs> I think what they mean is do you cook fancy food is what I think they really mean because gourmet cooking can be a sensational hamburger. And if you do it right. well, that's gourmet cooking. Right. You know? right. But anyway, you were short of one commodity in the, in the Chinese food that you were cooking. Yes, and I got in my airplane, I flew up to San Francisco, and I got it, and I flew back, and I rushed into my kitchen, and I absolutely made the dish perfectly. That's not true. How about <laughs> All my illusions being ripped away one well, by one. Well, there you are. It takes 55 minutes to drive up, to fly up to San Francisco in a jet. Mm. And by the time you get into Chinatown and buy all the food and come back, the soup got cold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the film, I think, if I have to nail my card face upward on the table, the film of yours which I most enjoyed in the whole uh, world was Walter Mitty. Now, does that, did that, for you, mean the exercise of a lot of work out of private fantasy? <clears throat> no, I am luckier than most because I have been able in my <coughs> real life to work out most of the fantasies that people have who become Walter Mitty. There's Walter Mitty or uh, Wilma Mitty in every lady and every gentleman here. Everybody has their own fantasies. Everybody has their own daydreams. What I worked out, worked out, what happened to me now here I was, born in Brooklyn of, of poor but dishonest parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to be a doctor when I was very young, and that couldn't happen. My father had you know, lost all his money in some kind of you know, stock thing or whatever, I don't know. And I naturally gravitated into this profession where I probably would have wound, wound up anyway, because I, I have some strange theories and they may, may not hold any water at all. See, I, I firmly believe that given equal opportunity, a man becomes what he has to become rather than what he wants to become. And what I had to become, I think, is what I became, which was an entertainer. It was probably the best way I knew how to express myself. Wanting to bring joy or entertainment to people and get that kind of joy and entertainment back from being able to do it. So here I was born in Brooklyn, and I arrived in London. The first time I played here was a disaster, and I came back in 1948. And I think we opened on February, in February, February 2nd or whatever. And it was a kind of fantastic success. And within the space of five or six weeks, I had been thrown together with people that, well, you know, uh, Strangely, only the kind you would imagine in your fantasies, you know. Famous people in all walks of life who, for the most part, were very, very kind. And it leads me to believe that if you scratch deep enough, you will always find the better qualities in somebody than... Conversely, people saying that if you scratch deep enough, you will always find the unattractive qualities in people. I don't find that. I find that pe people, by and large, are basically quite nice. And we all have rather lousy characteristics, and we have good ones. And if the good ones outweigh the bad ones, you know, we, we turn out to be nice people, or we turn out to be... <clears throat> Not nice. What I wouldn't like to have censored on the other thing. Not nice. We have another word for it. Well, good... Now, is the philo philosophy part of the show over now? I think nearly the whole of it. I think nearly the whole of it's over. The whole I hear, of it is over? I hear the, the wheels of Time's winged chariot coming behind us. Good. I think in final... Now, did it, seem, did it seem terribly long tonight? <coughs> I just wanted to say to you, before we do close, uh, two things. I think we'd like to end with some music of some sort, uh, which we may concoct between ourselves. And in finality, thank you, Danny Kay, for being my guest and also for making the world a happy place to live in. Danny Kay? Well, isn't that nice?
First you put your two knees close up tight You swing them to the left and then you swing them to the right Step around the floor kind of nice and light And then you twist around and twist around with all of your might Spread your loving arms way out in space You do the eagle rock that's got style and grace You put your left foot 